Islamic Language Symposium. Also everybody in the back row. Octave, <laughs> thank you. So you might have noticed this year's DLS is slightly different. We have uh, basically only invited talks. The idea was we have now roughly the 20s, it's actually the 19th year of DLS running, and we want to not do a look back, but a look forward. So I don't know whether any of you remember where you were about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I basically was in the first weeks of university, started studying computer science, felt math was never as hard before. I was always good at math, but uh, then suddenly in university, that was a very different ball game. So I don't think 20 years ago I could have imagined where we are today in terms of computer science, mostly because I didn't know anything. But I gave the brief to the speakers to imagine where we want to be in 20 years. So looking forward, trying to anticipate the big problems we want to have solved in 20 years and how to get there. So I hope um, we are going to hear some interesting ideas, a little bit of vision, because if I kind of look back how we got here 20 years long um, research. I don't think there were all that many paradigm shifts the last 20 years. Maybe that can change. Maybe can bigger jumps forward. So no pressure, Walter. No, absolutely. <laughs> Please take it from here. <laughs> OK, thank you, Stefan, for the introduction, also for the invitation. I don't know if uh, I'm going to show something uh, big problem, but at least I will uh, try to explain what is my vision and uh, where we can go in the future. Maybe not in 20 years, but in 10 years or 5 years. What the, maybe you have to speak on the microphone. Yeah. Maybe I have just to move it in front. Okay, uh, so my talk should be about polyglot programming. Uh, maybe this is a new term, I don't know. But anyway, it's something that is real at the moment. Uh, polyglot programming is uh, the practice that uh, often we have to write uh, a program using several languages, not just one. Uh, this is pretty well defined. Well defined. Uh, but the, the point is why we want to do that? Yeah, there are several reasons. Uh, the most popular is the fact that something uh, is more efficient. Some languages are more efficient than others, especially if they are compiled, and others are more simple than uh, to use than the others. So this is uh, normally when you are thinking of C, that is way more efficient than Python, but Python is way more easy to write code in. And uh, so the one reason could be this one, but it's not the only one. The other are just because they are not fully fledged uh, languages like, for example, CUDA or SQL, and they need to be hosted in another language. Uh, still, this is uh, quite a diffuse. If you look at GitHub and you f search for two languages, uh, there are several repositories that are using two languages, more than two languages also. Uh, some notable cases are OpenJDK. OpenJDK is written in C, C, C++, C, C++ and Java. The same is for TensorFlow that has three languages inside, C, C++, Java and Python, and uh, also C, Python, C and Python, and many, many other. If you are thinking, uh, well, uh, you are C, uh, surely using something that has be, been written using several languages. So it is real. It's a real thing, and maybe all of us are doing this. Okay, I try to uh, figure out how they are classified. Since uh, the things is real, what is really needed is to understand how it's real. So the first category that I spotted is the embedded languages. This is the easiest one. Uh, for example, this is C, but C has some keywords that permit to include uh, assembler code inside. Um, you, you know, the, the, the ASM one, the one with the frame around, the piece of code be, be between the braces are just a piece of assembler code. Uh, this is called assembler templates because uh, they, they are interacting with the rest of the C through templates. Those uh, percentage symbols are indicating some parameters that are taken from the environment. And uh, this is one example. This is more popular, probably. This is a HTML page, but 
all HTML pages. Nowadays, I have at least a script in it. This is written in a different language, in this case, JavaScript. And it is clear where it is the code, because you have some special keyword, in this case, script, and then the type of the script. And in there, there is the, the code. And last but not least, this is quite famous. You have SQL. SQL is not a really as a full-fledged language, so it needs another language in order to, to do its stuff. Or, and this is C with a piece of SQL. Still, the common point in all of this is that there is a keyword, a, a function, something that clearly states, OK, from this on, the code is written in a different language. In this case, it's like SQL. In the other cases, the script uh, keyword or the AS, uh, ISM keyword. OK, this is the first category. The difficulties in this case uh, is how things work together. So if you have data that have to pass it from one language to the other, there should be some support from the runtime environment or from the compiler that is doing the magic. Second one is. Uh, more smoothly, in some sense, because we have two languages, but they are sharing a lot of the architecture, so the things are working together smoothly. And this is, for example, the case of JRuby. JRuby in Java, JRuby is an implementation of Ruby for uh, the JVM, and uh, it is clearly working on top of that, and behind there is bytecode at the end, so they can smoothly work together. And this is exactly the case. We have uh, one uh, uh, class called me, that is defining something, and we have also an interface that is uh, asking for something else to be defined. And in the Ruby part, uh, we have uh, exactly the use of this. The arrows are showing where, which part are you using. And what is interesting is that, is that the two languages are so interwined that you can extend you can implement the interface. And this happens through the include. Uh, Call Java is a, a Ruby class, and uh, you are using the, the iSpeaker uh, interface, and then you can implement the method that is asked for. And this is all smoothly. And this is another example. We are speaking of Scala and Java. Still, we are still in the context of the JM, JVM, bytecode, and whatever. So the, 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 the things is still the same. And uh, in, the, in the top part, we have the Scala piece of code, where we are defining a companion object uh, that is a sort of a class with a singleton for, for the things. And uh, we have a, a set of, uh, of uh, methods, uh, dynamic uh, methods, of instance methods, or class methods, and these in Scala can be assessed. Also, those that are uh, have the same name, the, the static one, depend, depending on how you call it, can you call that? From Java, you can call it as well, but uh, there are some limitations because. Uh, the, the, the companion object uh, is a static class, uh, but is not anymore a Java class, and it is not overshadowing the, the yellow method. So the, the second method is, is not callable. At least I don't know how to call it. At some point, uh, there was some tricky that I was going to use some internal definition of Scala, but they are not working anymore. But still, this is a good compromise. You have something that is not available in Java, but you can still use it because of the interconnection with the, the Scala environment. OK, third kind. This is the most common. Probably any of you already saw that. Uh, the use of bindings. So basically, we have to write some piece of code that permits the people, the, the, the two languages, to speak. And uh, this permits also to have a different environment that, uh, that is cool, but also you can have uh, interpreted languages with compiled languages. Uh, this is Java again, uh, so uh, the, you probably know the GNI, the Java Native Interface. This permits to have a piece of code written in C or C++, and you can call this through Java. And also the vice versa, some, with some limitation. OK, how it works? You have the Java piece of code that wants to use the GNI, and you have to def define, which is this method. In this case, it's not, it's, uh, say, say hello. And uh, we specify that this is native, so that it should be defined somewhere else. OK, so 
it is written in C and we can expect the task to be compiled and then it should be loaded as a library. And uh, the load library command at the beginning the, the is initializing this connection. Okay, so when we compile, uh, we use the minus h flag and this is generating a sort of a stub that is describing how the method, the say hello method, should be in order to cooperate with Java. And this is, sounds a little bit strange because the, the magic behind this is that uh, the, the types that are used in C are different than the types that are used in Java and uh, the runtime environment is pro providing some mappings and this is uh, those strange names that you are finding in there. Last but not least, you have to implement this. And uh, you have to know the name, you have to know the kind of type that it is going to use, and your C function is a little bit different than what you are expecting. And this is part of the problem that we are speaking later. This is the example with Java and C, but we can also add something more esoteric. This is Erlang. We have uh, something similar to GNI. This is called NIF, that is native interface, interface function or something like that, implemented function or something like that. The sample is more or less the same, but at this point we are writing it in, uh, uh, so that it can be called by, by Erlang. So we have the, the piece of code that is a say hello in C, and then uh, at this point we, we have, uh, okay, I can move. We have to uh, write uh, the, the C binding manually. This is the main difference with the, 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 the one in Java. Uh, it, there is no magic at the moment, but you have to write it uh, manually. And still hold what I said before, you need to know the mapping of the types, you need to know how this is working. And uh, if you look, uh, the, the call to the C part is just one line that is more or less in the middle, this one. And uh, all the rest is something that permits the two languages to communicate. And, uh, and it is quite uh, a standard pattern, but uh, still something complex to write, especially the first time. And then you, given this, you have to write a module in Erlang that is calling it. That is providing that there is a, is a NIF and uh, the, there is, a, again, a library defining your your, uh, your piece of code, and this is one, the one you use, and there should be new slides when you are using the module. Finally, that one is the wrapper for Erlang, uh, you are loading this piece of code, and uh, from there on, given that you did the things correctly, you can call the methods. Uh, as you would did normally, you would do normally in uh, Erlang. Okay. And then there are still some approaches that are mixed and they are using more of, many of them in once. And the more prominent probably is Graal at the moment. We are still in, uh, in Java in some way, but the, there is a, a polyglot protocol that permits you to uh, basically have several languages cooperating together. In this case, uh, we have uh, uh, the user, the polyglot, polyglot protocol is defining uh, two methods, exports and imports, that uh, permit to have uh, the combination between the two languages. In our case, uh, we are speaking of JavaScript and Python. And this is more or less uh, as uh, the, the, the interoperable one, uh, the one uh, like Java and Scala. Then there is also the, the one through the bindings. In this case, uh, the bindings is written in LLVM and is provided by the, the Graal virtual machine. And it permits to have uh, mixed uh, the languages, like in this case, we have Rust in, in JavaScript. Rust is providing a factor, uh, and JavaScript is calling it in order to, to get the information. And, okay, now, what happens? Okay, the, the thing is quite diffuse. So I brought you several ways to do this. I brought you a lot of uh, languages that permit to do that. Uh, the, the way made on Dynamics basically uh, the, the only limitation is your fantasy because you have to write a lot of code, but at the end you can connect any kind of language. Okay, so which are the problems? Well, the problem are the, in, the real interconnection between the two. If we are just uh, <coughs> considering them as a sort of a process, a separate process, and you are just sharing something through socket or other, 
That is simple. But what you really want to have is a, a, a real deep uh, uh, interconnections where the data written by one function in a language can be used smoothly from the other language. Uh, this is uh, still a piece of code uh, and uh, should the evidence uh, put in evidence this problem. Uh, we, we are using, on the left, we are using PyCUDA, so we are defining some piece of code in Python that is uh, using this GPU in order to do some <coughs> vectors uh, summing. And uh, the piece of uh, CUDA code is the one in, uh, in gold, in some way. Uh, this is a string, this is another well-known problem, so we have uh, a piece of code, but this is just test, and uh, you can't do any static analysis from the, you can expect any static analysis from the compiler. Similar problem is uh, present also in the other one, this is OpenCL, OpenCL, uh, that is still uh, a way to do uh, GPU computing, uh, this time is in C, but still the, the portion for the, for the GPU is written in a string that has to be uh, compiled separately later. Which is the problem? The problem is that uh, these two are uh, spotting a, a type error. Uh, if you look at the add, we are saying that the, our vectors, those that are, we are summing, are float, but when we are defining the, the, the the real type uh, we are using hint. And this is making a problem when you are, uh, it is more clear in, in uh, C because C is defining the types, so Python is not. But still, what happens? When you are trying to do the, the, the calculation, there is an implicit conversion, no warning, nothing. You, you can look at the, the execution. And uh, the three vectors as we did them, the two vectors as we did, do them are made, uh, one is negative and the other one is the same vector but positive, so the sum should be zero, but it's not because of the conversion. So we are promoting the int to float and no one has noticed this and the result is wrong. This happens also, this is CUDA in C. CUDA in C is, is not anymore made as a string. The piece of uh, CUDA code is not anymore a string. We have two kernels, uh, one kernel there and then another one. This one is uh, still the same problem as before. So we are defining it as float, but we are passing some int vectors. Uh, and uh, the compiler is spotting this. So this is the main difference between uh, the, the, before, the one before and this one. And uh, uh, spotting this, so we, we have at least a warning or an error that we have something to solve. And this is the main point. So we change the, f the function using the int, and this point we get this better value. So the, the problems are uh, many in this case. Uh, we have the, the fact that some languages are embedded, but uh, they are embedded as a string. So they are not really languages, and there is no part of the compiler that is looking at it uh, in some way. And then uh, we also have some problem with dealing with the, the, the data and uh, the compatibility, compat compatibilities between this data. OK. The second one should be more evident, at least from the NIF example that I showed before. It is complex. It is a little bit complex. OK, normally writing C code and Erlang code is not that difficult. But when you have to write your own bindings, not in Java. Java is generating it for you, but you still, you, you remember, you have still to know the names. And the names are something difficult. You have to know the, the, the types that you are dealing with. And the, you have to open the reason a type that has a mapping inside. The, so passing classes could be complicated. Passing objects could be complicated. But when you are going to another language where there is the idea of bindings, but there is not a real support, like in this case, you have to write this by yourself. And uh, the real code is just this line. All the rest is uh, uh, some mocking code that is needed in order to have the system working. And it is way complex. And this is something that I don't want to write in any way. Last but not least, if we are going to have a polyglot programming, this should be supported at any level in the development cycle. At the moment, since uh, we are good in, de in developing code and we are good in developing code in some way, in some specific way, uh, what happens is just that we are considering each piece of code written in a single language in isolation. Okay? That works. Yes and no. Uh, for example, when we are doing something that 
com that should involve the whole analysis of the code that we have, taking in consideration the languages separately can do some problems. For example, for debugging, if you have a you want to debug your application and you are just considering the part in Java, but the value is created in the C part and you don't have a, a way to look at it, could be a problem. But also for something more general, if you have a continuous integration mechanism and you want to do regression testing, for those that doesn't know, is a way to reduce the number of tests that you have to check when you go to the second uh, revision. And you are just considering one part, this could be a problem. And we did experiment about this. Uh, we took uh, TensorFlow and OpenJDK that I told at the beginning that uh, they are using several languages and they are also quite huge, so the number of tests is uh, relevant. So in the case of uh, OpenJDK, we are speaking of 35,000 tests. So running every time you commit something, all of them is, uh, is something that is taking time and you don't want, so regression test selection is something you need. But in this case, since uh, the, most of the approaches are just considering one language at a time, we are losing more or less 10% of the test that should be reselected. Uh, that means, okay, you can be lucky and they are not spotting any error and okay, but in general, 10% of 35K is a quite huge number. And uh, uh, avoid using that, neglecting to use them could be a problem at the end. Uh, we are doing this experiment now. I'm just uh, having a few data. And we are also considering that uh, uh, we are writing a mechanism for having all the language together and doing the test. Later, more on this, not, not today, of course. Okay, so what I'm expecting in 10 years? Well, I'm expecting uh, evolution in several directions. Uh, from the programming perspective, um, I would like to have something simpler. Uh, Graal is going that direction, but still I think there, there should be something to be improved. Uh, for sure it will become more common and this need uh, to be more simpler, for sure. And it should be available for any language. It would be nice to have it interoperable for any language. For example, .NET, when, uh, when it was in famous at the beginning, the, any language written for .NET has this kind of interoperability, as now is done for the Java virtual machine, more or less. From another perspective, the one from the programming languages, I would like to have any sort of a standardization of this. Uh, for example, the main problem is the types, the data that you are sharing between the different languages, and the, the languages have all int, they have all float, but they are all different implemented. And this is making problems. Uh, if there was a standard that is not just for the language, but is for all the languages, or a way to consider objects in a general way for any kind of a language, could be an improvement for this kind of programming. Uh, so th that is part of the problem, many problems created by that. But the last, uh, and, but not least, uh, we have also the software engineering perspective. Uh, we can't anymore consider our program by each language. We have to consider it as a whole. And uh, this is more difficult because the other two directions are already in, in some road, but there is really little or nothing about the last one. And uh, still, uh, remember that, uh, okay, we are doing programming language, most of us are doing programming languages, but at the end, people outside the academia is using a real context where software engineering and the development cycle as a role, and we have to think also to that. Okay, that should be all. So if you have questions, I'm here. start with a question. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned software engineering as a big problem, yeah. but how do you see the human aspect in there, especially the skill of being able to work with multiple languages? Is that something? Yeah, I didn't consider that, but yes, this is one. Especially if we don't have uh, uh, some magic for creating the bindings, for example. 
uh, we are asking people to understand two languages. That is still possible. Many of us are speaking several programming languages. And, uh, but the writing, uh, the connecting code is the most difficult part because uh, you, you are moving in the, in the between and uh, you need to know how the things work. And this sometimes needed you dig a little bit more. For example, when I was speaking about the, the Java and Scala example, that is pretty easy. But uh, if you want to call the static method that has the same name, what I did is look at the bytecode generated by the class. And uh, then I discovered there was a special field that I can use for call this. This is not something that uh, all the people is doing. Uh, and this is part of the problem because we don't have a clear interface, we don't have a lot of things for this kind of a programming. Most of the things for polyglot programming is left to the writer, to the code writer. Yeah, so the human part is relevant as well. Do we have an... And maybe m more comments and a question. I've been very surprised that all along this presentation you have not been using the word garbage collection. <laughs> So how come you have not been talking this about This is because you are thinking that it's all garbage. <laughs> okay, I didn't uh, because that is another huge problem, but uh, I am eating that uh, in the, we need tools for, as well as the bugger garbage collector is one of the tools that we need. And having several languages uh, with several different rules for garbage, for saying what is garbage, is a problem at the end, and uh, yes. but. Uh, it is not mentioned directly, but it is meant to be there, as well as linters, as well as many other things that you are running into. Yeah. Okay, just to keep going with this question, don't you consider or don't you believe that this is maybe the main problem when you are interfacing a high-level language in C, for instance, dealing with different strategy for memory allocation? That's true. It's still, uh, yeah, it's a still a valid question, and uh, well, the, this is still about the fact that they are built in a different way. Python is still uh, allocating uh, stuff somewhere, but you don't know about that, and it is automatically garbage collected. And uh, see, you have to do that manually, and you have to be sure that there are not memory leak. Uh, you can consider that in isolation because uh, you can. Uh, be able to write whatever is needed for that piece. But when things are moving from one code to the other, you have to think of something that is dealing with this case as well. At the moment, there is nothing uh, of that. Uh, I think they are, there is a lot of code, but most of them are using, it, like, for example, TensorFlow. That is a nice uh, case. We have three languages because they are providing the bindings for different languages in order to call the library. So you have Java and Python, probably if you look around, there are several other. But they are basically two processes and they are sharing some data through, they are not directly using the data, they are sharing through sockets or something like that in order to understand what happens. And, but this is not what we are looking for in the long term. In the long term, we are thinking about the problem that we are mentioning. So the, the, the thing that that are moving, are really moving, I think, more or less, the, the, the problems are the same, take this uh, with a uh, salis granis, uh, as uh, we had in the past for the distributed system, when uh, data were moving like object migration and stuff like that, we have exactly the same problems. Now, just uh, maybe not anymore to, to in different uh, machines and different computers, but we still have the problem, the same kind of problem. The data have to be dealt in the same way, you have to migrate data that have some memory location information, uh, they are dead in some way, you have to discover how to deal with them, and so on and on. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, this is more like a comment, perhaps an open question. So, you show CUDA, and then you show OpenCL, and then you show one with embedded you know, string, and then move into the CUDA yeah. language. The issue I see is that, well, I see the trend as well. There is one uh, new primary model, it's called One API from Intel, also the SQL standard, single, single source property. So you have your device code and your host code in the single source. And I see the trend moving there, right? But the issue I still see is that the same source, you see different programming models and execution models, right? Programming model is the how you program things, execution model is how the machine executes. 
because you have a single property and you're running on the C side, on the CPU, you have the C or CPU execution mode, while some, sort of, some part of the programs go to the GPU programming model, which is very execution model, sorry, which is very different. So my question is, do you see any change or how we should approach future okay. software? GPU computing is quite new as well, and uh, the, this is a real problem because exactly you have uh, the model execution that is different, and uh, uh, yeah, you have problem. And in the future, we have to think of this also without polyglot programming, but just in order to understand how the two hardware architecture are, are working behind, and uh, your code should take this in, in consideration at the end. Yes, so yes. Is still part of the problem, so the framework has to be defined. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Walter one more time. Thank you.